Tonight, Canadians dare to dream as Soccer's World Cup kicks off. I'm just hoping that Canada pull a big surprise. Alfonso Davies is a big reason for high hopes. We want to make it as memorable as possible. We're all looking forward to it. My exclusive interview with Canada's superstar. Looking for new leadership, Canada's Greens turn to the past. I'm not going to be staying around uh, in a ever sinking ship. Go Public investigates last minute price hikes at car dealerships. Disappointed would be putting it mildly. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. The eyes of the world turned to the nation of Qatar today as the FIFA World Cup got underway. An estimated 1.2 million visitors are expected during the four-week tournament, one of the challenges for a country about the size of Cape Breton Island. And this tournament isn't just about the soccer. Many human rights activists continue to call out the decision to have it there in the first place. Today, Qatar's national team helped kick things off. Thomas Dagler shows us that for many fans, excitement is building. Here it is, both a tournament of dreams for soccer fans and a human rights nightmare for critics. The Men's World Cup staged for the first time in the blazing sun of the Middle East. I'm really, 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 really it's excited. Very excited for us, for everybody. Yes. On day one, no fan has lost hope yet. Every nation dares to believe. Qatar win, win Qatar, inshallah. <laughs> Obviously, we'd all love to say that we could win it. Yes, this time, even Canadians can wish. I'm just hoping that Canada pull a big surprise. Any team to just to be here is achievement. For the first time in 36 years, the Maple Leaf is flying to represent a qualified nation. Baram Farhang and Baman Bayat flew in from Toronto, but they sure thought twice about their visit. We're hoping that this pushed the government of Qatar to be more inclusive. Everyone is speaking up maybe that would do something. All around tournament sites, migrant workers are still toiling in the sun. Laborers endured brutal, sometimes deadly conditions to build all this sparkling infrastructure. Doha's new metro, its new airport, seven new stadiums, all on the backs of migrant workers. This is a mega event like no other. As I say, it's a nation building project for Qatar as, as much as it is anything else. With more than a million visitors bound for Doha, some are staying on cruise ships docked in the port, others flying in from Dubai on match days. Or how about a stay in a glorified shipping container presented as a cabin? $200 US a night will get you one of these. Those who've already checked in have no complaints so far. We, uh, we looked at the, uh, the hotels and they were super expensive. It is amazing. We have neighbors from all over the countries. For a month, Qatar welcomes the world. After years of controversy, there's no stopping it now. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Doha. And Canada plays its first match on Wednesday and all eyes will be on superstar Alfonso Davies. Before he traveled to Doha, we spoke about Canada's long-awaited World Cup return. Stepping on the pitch, you know, uh, in a World Cup, you know, it's every, every kid's dream, every footballer's dream. You can catch our full conversation. That's coming up in about 25 minutes. Kids in Ontario will be in classrooms tomorrow after the provincial government reached a tentative deal with education support workers. This is a positive outcome for all the parties, uh, but the biggest beneficiary of this deal is our kids who are going to have some stability. Ontario's education minister didn't provide details about the agreement reached with the Canadian Union of Public Employees. The union had negotiated a wage increase earlier this week and was fighting for guaranteed staffing levels, which it says the government has not agreed to. Workers were preparing to go on strike tomorrow for the second time this month. There's mixed reaction tonight to the UN Climate Summit's final deal. While it's a landmark agreement in some respects, some critics say it doesn't go far enough. International climate correspondent Susan Ormiston is in Sharm el-Sheikh and takes us through the long night of tense negotiations. It just took so long. Inside the final COP meeting, diplomats and delegates from nearly 200 countries were spent trying to come to a consensus. 
It's five in the morning. Most of these delegates have been negotiating for the better part of three days. They're exhausted, but they're still looking at text, trying to get this agreement across the line. Wrangling a deal at these climate talks nearly failed. Tensions were rising, ministers were leaving, and disagreements behind closed doors broke into the open. At this point, we are very worried by the state of the negotiations and what is being presented by the presidency. But finally, they got there. I now invite the COP to adopt the decision entitled Funding Arrangements for Responding to Loss and Damage. Committing to an historic deal, a fund to help poor countries ravaged by a severe climate, paid for by countries with high emissions, an acknowledgement of responsibility. A serious relief after almost 30 years when this idea of uh, reparation, of paying back the debt, of climate justice, of you know, a fund, an emergency fund to support uh, communities, countries that may be hit by disasters. A big win for developing countries, but other players left dissatisfied. Mr. Timmerman, we're, f we're from Canada. The European Union, echoed by Canada, urged tougher efforts to curb CO2 emissions. We don't speed up the reduction of our emissions. There's no amount of money on this planet that can pay for all the loss and all the damages that will be there. And a push to phase down oil and gas was blocked. Many don't want this topic to be raised. I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia. I'm thinking about Iran. I'm thinking about Russia. So COP27 officially ended Sunday with mixed success. Just as the baking sun was waking up over the Red Sea. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. There are questions tonight about the future of Canada's Green Party. Longtime leader Elizabeth May is back at the helm, along with a co-leader. After party members voted Saturday night, though, in very low numbers, David Thurton looks at what might be in store for a party that has weathered controversy and confusion. The once and future leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May. Canada's Greens turning to the past to try and find their future. Former leader Elizabeth May making a comeback at age 68. We're fighting for our grandchildren. We don't give up. We don't take breaks. We work till we ensure that the planet is secure. May's election may look like deja vu, but this party insider says change comes in different forms. Sometimes it's stabilizing with something we're familiar, so that person can help us turn that leaf. Since May stepped down in 2019, the Greens have been plagued by infighting, financial trouble, and sustained allegations of systemic discrimination. May ran as part of a two-person team, so did her opposition. Her running mate recognizes the challenges ahead. We know that there is much to do to cultivate trust, to rebuild trust internally. But those who had high hopes under former leader Annie Paul aren't optimistic. I'm not going to be staying around uh, in a ever uh, sinking ship in order to battle for uh, things that I think are very important. The Greens are already in a tough spot, struggling for space in a crowded political field, according to this poll watcher. Other parties like the Liberals, like the New Democrats, have also taken ownership of the environment file, and that has made the Greens less of a factor than they might have been before. May begs to differ. When the Secretary General of the United Nations says the world is on a highway to climate hell, we're the only relevant party. It is certainly the only federal political party that will attempt to lead with two leaders if it can get the necessary approval from its members. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Tonight, the snow in New York State keeps piling up with a few more centimeters coming down in some places. Earlier in the day, people rushed to dig out as the snow subsided. The storm began pummeling the state on Friday. Western New York, which has been hit the hardest, recorded a total of 196 centimeters. That's almost six and a half feet in one area. Lots of flights were canceled, but there is an urgency to restore travel because U.S. Thanksgiving is later this week. At least five people are dead after a shooting at a gay nightclub in Colorado. Two other people who were inside are being hailed as heroes for subduing the shooter in a matter of minutes. 
Here's Paul Hunter with what we know at this hour. The scene now so grotesquely familiar to so many Americans. Sorrow after yet another mass killing. This time, it happened just before midnight at a gay and lesbian nightclub about an hour south of Denver. Authorities aren't yet calling it a hate crime, but that's the strong suspicion. Inside the club, a man opened fire with what's described as a powerful long rifle in a place the LGBTQ community had considered a safe haven. As I was dancing on the dance floor, um, I heard shots fired. All I can think about is everything, my life, just everything, friends, family, loved ones. What I can't stop thinking about is the visuals of the evening, of, of, uh, of the bodies, of the blood, of the broken glass, of the, the carnage and the wreckage. We are actively processing the scene at Club, Club Q. Police say club patrons prevented this from being much worse, confronting the shooter and holding him down until police arrived and arrested him. As they now try to learn more, including a motive, police can hardly find words to describe what happened. I'm so terribly saddened and heartbroken. For many Americans, it echoes the horrific mass killing at the Pulse nightclub in Florida in 2016 that left 49 dead and 53 others injured. This one comes as threats and violence targeting the LGBTQ community in America have lately ticked up. Said U.S. President Joe Biden, the U.S. cannot and must not tolerate hate. But even as the country now deals with this latest mass killing, history here underlines there will be more. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is denying reports he was briefed on extensive Chinese election interference. And I get briefed up regularly from our intelligence and security officials. I have no information on any federal candidates receiving money from China. According to Global News, Trudeau learned of at least 11 candidates in the 2019 federal election who received funding from China. Trudeau says he's ordered security officials to hand over whatever they know to the parliamentary committee looking into the allegations, but insists he was never briefed on them. At a security conference in Halifax, a former president of Ukraine told the audience the only way to achieve peace in Ukraine is total victory against Russia. Don't trust Putin. Putin understands only one thing, strength. Petro Poroshenko said an early ceasefire with Vladimir Putin would only be used by Russia to recruit more forces for renewed attacks on Ukraine. The Ukraine war and the protests in Iran were top issues at this year's Halifax International Security Forum. But global leaders weren't the only ones taking an interest. Staff at the event included recent arrivals from Ukraine and Iran. Maury Brewster got their perspective on some foreign affairs that hit very close to home. This weekend, Sahar Golizadak, a 19-year-old visiting Iranian student, shared a tearful hug with one of her inspirations, Masi Alinajad is a leading voice in the global protests against the Iranian regime. She's one of the heroes for myself because not only she's a lady, that she's against the regime and she's doing uh, her best for informing other people. Golizada works part-time at the hotel where Alina Jad delivered fiery remarks to a panel at the Halifax International Security Forum. <laughs> They met as Iran handed out more death sentences to anti-government demonstrators. And as the war in Ukraine briefly spilled over the border onto NATO territory in Poland. Events that normally form the basis of abstract debate here among diplomats, soldiers and politicians. It's more personal this year. When I just come to the table to take an order, um, not everybody knows, of course, that I'm from Ukraine. So I started to ask questions in Ukrainian, and they're, oh my God, you're from Ukraine. More than a dozen Ukrainian refugees are working at the hotel, pouring drinks, waiting tables, and making up rooms for the top security, defense, and political figures. First, they say thank you because uh, every, everyone, they made a lot of, for Ukrainian, like uh, any help, it's very important. As she checked in, Ukraine's deputy prime minister came face to face with a woman from Odessa. We cried, 
and um, she she was from the the same uh, city where where I'm coming from. So so I know um, I know how did she felt. The Ukrainians are confident they'll return home someday, although the consensus among top officials here is that it's going to be a long war. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Halifax. BC's brand new premier is indicating a tougher approach to public safety issues. Amid an ongoing overdose crisis and many random assaults, David E.B. sketched out a plan to address crime, mental health and addiction issues. Susanna De Silva has the details and the reaction. Just two days after being sworn in, big promises from BC's new premier. And I told you that I'd hit the ground running. Uh, we, are, uh, we are working hard. Newly announced measures include new teams to deal with emergency mental health calls and to monitor repeat offenders, plus a directive that prosecutors argue against bail in some of those cases and leaving open the possibility of forcing people into treatment. How much of that are we willing to give up in return for security? The former head of the BC Civil Liberties Association used to fight on behalf of residents of the downtown east side. He even wrote a handbook on people's rights while being arrested. We continue to use that handbook today. So I find it quite ironic that David Eby is going to move forward and is proposing all of these uh, essentially, you know, Byzantine carceral systems that will throw people into, uh, again, having their rights stripped of them. But Vancouver's police chief welcomed Eby's plans. I think this plan has a lot of potential. We have a new mayor in the city of Vancouver who is also very interested in public safety issues. So I think it's good timing, actually. Part of the timing is last month's choice from voters for big municipal changes, something for EB to consider. Now as Premier of the province, he is he's the Premier for all of British Columbians. And of course, it's that constituency now, which is much larger, that is the key to winning another election. So he's he's on the other side of the fence. But I don't think he's lost empathy. The specifics and benchmarks around many of the promises were not laid out, and Eby says those will take time. This is not a change that's going to happen overnight, uh, but my goal is uh, we've got uh, two years before the next election to show uh, progress. One of many tests for the province's new premier. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Tonight, there are new complaints about car dealerships and the last-minute fees they're springing on customers. It's either pay up or the sale is off. As Erica Johnson explains in this Go Public investigation, it's all happening thanks to a loophole. Every time Randy Lowry goes for a drive, he worries. His car is 17 years old and breaking down. He settles on a new Kia Telluride, signs an agreement and puts down a $1,000 deposit. Four months later, his car arrives, so he heads down to the dealership and speaks to the sales manager. And about the first words out of his mouth were, there's been a price adjustment. To which I said, well, no, there hasn't, because we have a, we have a, a contract. The dealer had added another 2400 bucks to the bill, a market adjustment fee. Disappointed would be putting it mildly. <laughs> Across the country, customers are being forced to pay additional fees or buy extras like extended warranties and service plans. They told them that they have no choice but to accept these new conditions, otherwise the car is going to go to another customer. And I don't know what else you can call that other than extortion. Another dealership told this couple they had to pay an extra $5,000 fee if they wanted a car. The only excuse they had was that because of the shortage of vehicles, Everybody was, all, all everybody was doing, doing it. it. A microchip shortage and other supply chain issues in the pandemic has meant a shortage of cars and a chance to jack up the bill. For every 30 cars they have coming in, they have 100 customers that want the car. Thing is, it's all happening thanks to a loophole. Provincial regulators we spoke to said they can only investigate if shoppers have seen an advertised price that doesn't include those extra costs. Unfortunately, the legislation doesn't necessarily give us the authority to do anything about it. Lowry ended up walking away from the deal and says he's too discouraged to keep shopping. Go Public asked Kia Canada about his case. The car manufacturer said it has no control over sales, that franchises are independently owned and operated, but said in this volatile market, dealerships are encouraged to uphold pricing whenever possible. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca.
As the World Cup gets underway, Canadians will be watching one man closely, Alfonso Davies. Sensational, sensational, sensational. A refugee to Canada, he tells me about his journey to the top of the soccer world. The World Cup, you know, is every, every kid's dream. And the Blue Bombers vie for a historic win. We own this, we own this. Plus, an Ontario man finds fame by putting our emotions in motion. I always say, if there's a situation, there is a gift for it. We're back in two. It was about minus 10 with the wind chill in Regina, but the cold was worth enduring, at least for Toronto fans who saw an electrifying finish to a Grey Cup thriller. The Argos have broken a five-year Grey Cup drought. No three-peat for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, though. Sam Sampson is there. Sam? That's right. And it was such a dramatic game right until the last minute here at Mosaic Stadium. But as you mentioned, those Toronto Argonauts are the CFL 2022 champions. Unseating the champs, the Argonauts clinching their first Grey Cup in five years. We, we, we blocked out the media. We blocked out everyone saying that we couldn't beat them. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just proud of the, the team and how we rallied. And we ended up winning the game. It was a team effort. Everybody did what they needed to do. We believed all season long. And then now look around. The Argos inched their way onto the board bit by bit in the first quarter, making small but significant gains on Winnipeg through the entire game until... And one of the oldest trophies in Canada's history will go to one of its oldest franchises. The Toronto Argonauts have won the 2022 Grey Cup. They clinched the win with one point, 24 to 23. He nails that one. Argos fans were definitely outnumbered, but hopeful. It would help, like, uh, the East Division of the CFL as well. And as, and as far as getting fan support out to the games and stuff, I think it would be awesome. Go Argos, go, go, go! And they had some help. We're not cheering for Winnipeg. Secret, yeah. secret Ar Argo fans Argos. today. Now, such a dramatic game right until the very end, as I mentioned. So here's how it went down. Right until the very end, 24-23, Winnipeg kicked a field goal to try to come out on top. Toronto blocked that kick, and that secured their place as the 2022 champs. And this win is huge. I was speaking with the president of the Friends of the Argonauts fan club earlier this week at the Grey Cup festivities, and she was saying that this win could grow the fan base, as you heard there, in a city that has a lot of different choices for sports fans. So that way that maybe the CFL fan base could grow as well. Huge win for Toronto, as you mentioned too, they haven't won a Grey Cup since 2017, and now they have seven, uh, rather, a Grey Cup run of seven wins in a row. So for the past seven times that they have been in a Grey Cup final, they have won. This is huge for the Toronto Argonauts. Yeah, Blue Bomber fans, pretty quiet walking out of Mosaic Stadium here tonight. But the Toronto Argonauts are the champions this year. Sam Sampson, CBC News, reporting live, Regina. All right, and still to come, Canadians are waiting to hear if soccer star Alfonso Davies will play in Canada's first match at the World Cup. He says he's raring to go. Goal! I caught up with the soccer phenom who tells me the road to the World Cup had a humble beginning. Changing, changing diapers at, uh, at the age of, I think, 9, 10 wasn't easy. My conversation with Alfonso Davies is next. Hey guys, your boy from the Davies, and today I'm going to be talking with Ian in Munich. Really excited about this interview. It's going to start in a moment, but first, Alfonso's story in 30 seconds. At just 22 years old, Alfonso Davies is already considered by many the greatest Canadian soccer player of all time. Davies was just 15 years old when he began his professional career with the Vancouver Whitecaps. And not long after, he was putting on a show in Major League Soccer. And now a chance here for Davies again. Mark, right in the play, he's able to finish. The world took notice. And a few months before his 18th birthday, 
Davy signed with the storied German franchise Bayern Munich. Brilliant run by Davis. Sensational! 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 He is now a bona fide star with one of the biggest teams in the world. A dream that started as a kid in Edmonton where his family settled as refugees after fleeing civil war in Liberia. Edmonton is where Davies first fell in love with the game and set him on a path to become the face of Canadian soccer. Alfonso Davies keeps it himself! Goal! Alfonso Davies, are you kidding me? We have a lot to talk about in terms of what's going on now, but, but I want to go back just for a couple of moments and, and ask you first of all about just your love of soccer. Like when you think back to your childhood, do you, do you remember that moment where you thought, I just love this game so much? Yeah, growing up, uh, my, my dad played, you know, uh, in Edmonton for, you know, a couple of years. I mean, it wasn't anything special, but me watching him growing up, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, I just try to try to replicate what I see and I try to put it in my game. Even at a young age, playing football was just, for me, for fun. It was just me being myself, you know, expressing myself, being um, who I am and, and just enjoying the game. Your, your parents, their incredible story of being refugees, coming to Canada, having to work really long hours, and, and you put in a position, as I understand it, to, to help take care of your siblings at home. Yeah, growing up, my parents, uh, they did each work two jobs each, you know, trying to uh, provide for the family. I had a little brother and a little sister. Yeah, I mean, changing changing diapers at, uh, at the age of, I think, 9, 10 wasn't easy. You know, I, I myself, I'm, I'm a kid as well, so... Yeah. And once I step on the football pitch, you know, I forget about all that, you know. Uh, I just go out there, have fun, you know, just enjoy in every moment that I have uh, to play the, play the sport. What is your goal as a player? Um, my goal as a player to reach professional level and probably play with some of the pros. And then at 14 years old, the Vancouver Whitecaps come calling and they want you to move to from Edmonton to Vancouver to be part of their development program. And from what I understand, your mom was re reluctant. How did you convince her to, to let you go? Yeah, when the Vancouver came knocking to the door at 14, you know, it was, it was a tough moment because, you know, my mom is very keen on education. You know, obviously, uh, her and my father didn't get the education they, they always dreamed of, and they wanted their kids to have it as well. So. She didn't want me to go to Vancouver and change, you know, become something that I'm that I'm not. And you know, I, I made a promise to her, and promised that I'll be the same. You know, I'll focus on my studies, and and then uh, yeah, she she let me go. You know, I'm happy that she did. A lot of people are happy that she did. That was then, and then you walk into Munich. You walk into this training facility, and all the pressures that all of a sudden you had to face at 18 years old. What was that like? Coming here, I knew that, you know, they had the uh, world-class players on this team. Players that have won World Cups, multiple Champions Leagues. Um, for me, coming in, into this team at 18 was just me learning, you know, to learn from all these guys, to learn, you know, how they became, you know, who they are and how they became so good. You know, I waited for my opportunity. I worked as hard as possible. And when I got my opportunity, you know, I showed what I, what I can do. And, yeah, and, and it's going pretty well right now. Looks like you feel like you're home. Yeah, this is this is definitely my home. You know, I feel comfortable here. Everyone makes it comfortable. Being with each other, it's just, uh, it's just a good vibe, not just on the pitch, off the pitch as well, you know, to have, have a good connection with uh, each player. With the squad. With the squad, you know what I'm saying? You know the vibes. Speaking of good vibes, um, you've become a social media phenomenon. You've got more than... 5 million followers on Instagram, more than 6 million on TikTok. It's extraordinary what you do on there. What, what's your motivation? I mean, for me, it's not really motivation. Nah, it's just, you know, me being a kid, I guess, me showing my, my personality, you know, on social media, you know, showing, I guess, how, how I am, you know, off the pitch. But uh, other than that, it's just authentic, you know, I just, 
sit on my couch, say something, and then I post it. You know, that's just how I'm feeling. I guess I just speak my mind. You know this thing on? How old is my soulmate right now? Oh! Hey, Google. Oh, every day this guy calls my name at least 20 times a day. Yeah, how can I help you? The social media version of Alfonso Davies does seem like a fun guy. And, and I guess that's what you're really like. But also on, on Twitch, I saw a clip where you, you said, you know what, like you're living a great life. It's great to be a professional football player. But at the same time, it's kind of lonely here. You don't have a big group of, of friends. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice, you know, to be a professional, to, you know, to play the sport I love each and every day. You know, after training, I think... Uh, when you go home, you know, most of the players, they have, you know, families, they have uh, kids, they have wives, you know, they have people around them. For me, I came here by myself, you know, I have a couple friends. I don't really get to see them often, but uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it gets lonely when you're sitting at home and you're just, you know, thinking to yourself, like, what is there to do? I mean, I guess it comes, comes with the job, you know? We have a lot of positive things to talk about, but I want to ask you about one other big challenge, and that was the myocarditis, the enlargement of the heart that you got after you were infected with COVID. That, that must have been a scary time. Yeah, that was very scary. I was just doing my time at home, my quarantine, and I got a phone call from the doctor. He was like, yeah, you have uh, myocarditis. You know, I didn't know what it was. You know, he explained to me what it was, and I was like, okay, so I was like, all right, how long am I gonna be out? I think that's, that was a scary, scary thing when he said, we don't know. So now I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like, you know, my, I was in shock. You know, I didn't believe that I could be sitting out for, for one year of football not playing. Um, yeah, it was scary. I mean, yeah, I'm happy that I was able to be back, you know, in the three months, four months period. And uh, everything's looking good. I'm healthy again, so I'm happy. So you missed some games, including... You missed the game where Canada qualified for the World Cup. Yeah. But you watched it, and we watched you watching it. <laughs> this is the moment the country has waited for. I've dreamt of this moment. My dreams about to come true. Just like I do. The whole country. Everybody on this pitch, everybody in Canada. Dreams about to come true, bro. Boys did well, man. Man, these guys did so well. I can't read it. <laughs> when I found out that I wasn't able to, you know, be with the team, you know, when they qualify, you know, it's a moment that would last forever in everybody's mind, you know, not just the players, you know, the whole country. You know, it was really emotional because we started this journey, I don't know how long ago, and. We all told ourselves that we want to make it to the World Cup. You know, we know it wasn't going to be an easy road. And yeah, I mean, that time was, was very emotional for everybody. You know, not just for me, you know, for the whole, everybody on the, on the pitch. And also, I'm sure some Canadian fans as well. And now just at 22 years old, you are one of the leaders of the team. You know, your teammates, an entire country is going to be looking at you for leadership in what's going to be a tough qualifying round. How are you feeling about that? It's going to be a lot, you know, stepping on the pitch, you know, uh, in a World Cup, you know, it's every, every kid's dream, every footballer's dream. It's truly incredible, um, you know, not just for me, for the players that is on the team and also a whole country as well. You know, 36 years, a long time. And uh, yeah, our first one, we want to make it as memorable as possible. For most players, it's their first. And uh, yeah, we're all, we're all looking forward to it. I want to play a, a clip from the interview that you and I did four years ago. Sure. And I asked you then about your uh, motivation, like kind of, you know, what motivated you as a young man playing football. And here's a clip, and we edited it back four years ago, but I just want to play it for you now. Seeing where they come from and seeing where we are now, I think that's one of the reasons I try to keep my head, head level, you know, and I'm also trying to, you know, stay humble for my mom. You know, she gave me the opportunity and I don't want to be, you know, be getting a big head and then something happened and then she goes, what happened? You know, I don't want to disappoint her. So that was Alfonso Davies four years ago. You were <laughs> laughing when you saw yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's funny seeing yourself when you're so young. 
But in terms of your motivation four years ago to not disappoint your parents, your mother in particular, how would you describe that now? I think I'm doing a good job. Um, yeah, they're, they're proud of me. You know, they're, they're happy. They call me every day, you know, to check up. And, you know, uh, they told me how proud they are of me. You know, it's, it's nice to see because they sacrificed so much to, to give us a better life. And, and I want to give, uh, you know, everything back to them. You know, they're my, they're the reason why every, every, each and every day I get up to, to play the sport that I love and, and do my best each and every day. Well, you've given them a lot of reason to be proud. You've given Canadians a lot of reason to be proud, and uh, we wish you luck at the World Cup. Thank you so much. And to see more of Alfonso Davies and the Canada men's soccer team, watch Soccer North live immediately following all the Canadian games. It's on CBC Gem and CBC Sports' YouTube channel. Of course, along with Alfonso Davies, there are lots of other players on the roster, and nearly a third come from one city. The team from Canada wouldn't be the team that it is without the lads from Brampton. What makes Brampton such a soccer powerhouse? We go there to find out next. After a 36-year drought, Canada's World Cup return has fans excited. Back in 1986, the team didn't score a single goal, but this time expectations are high, and not just because of Alfonso Davies. Seven other top-notch players have something to do with it. Nick Purden shows us what they have in common. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Listen to the coach. Work to keep the ball close. My dream is uh, to be a soccer player, the best soccer player in the world. Now we're only a couple of days away from Canada's first game at the World Cup. This is a big deal because Team Canada hasn't even qualified since 1986. So how come they're in the tournament this time? Part of the answer is Brampton, Ontario, which is where I am right now. Seven of the players on Team Canada come from this Toronto suburb. What's up with soccer in Brampton? Good, good boy. Well played. Let's keep moving, keep moving. Hey, hi, how are you doing? That's coach Desmond Gardner. If anyone knows soccer here, it's him. He's the head coach of the Brampton Soccer Club, and he's been teaching the game for 30 years. Why does he think there's so many players from Brampton on the World Cup team? A lot of the players, they come from really diverse backgrounds. So if you look at the population of Brampton, it's, it, it, it's one of the most diverse uh, cities in the country. You had um, parents with backgrounds from right across the globe. And, and one of the big things, the universal you know, to all of them, those, uh, those countries, was soccer. To his bells, good. Keep that ball moving, side to side. Good boy. Come on, come on, good. There are immigrants everywhere in Canada, but what was different in Brampton, Coach Gardner says, is that the soccer clubs welcomed their expertise and turned them into coaches. Now, even, even myself, they never knew me from Adam, but they, gave, they, they were prepared to give me an opportunity to come in and, and, and to work with the players. They gave the coaches the opportunity to go out there and work the magic, and they worked the magic. Good, keep the ball moving. Head up, head up, head up, remember. The magic sure worked. All the players from Brampton on Canada's national team come from immigrant families. So how did they get so good? Well, let me tell you the story of Atiba Hutchison. We started playing soccer, and I mean, I couldn't wait to get home, you know, cook quickly to go to his games, and, and just watching him play was like magic. It was only like, like magic, you know? Atiba's mom, Myrtle, came to Canada from Trinidad in the 1970s. You come to Canada, you know, it's a land of opportunity. So you come here and you work and you, you know, you have your family, you get a house and, you know, and you instill that in them too, you know. Anything that you need in life, you have to work hard for it. Whether it be um, soccer or, or, you know, just an ordinary job, you know, whatever it is, you have, you instill that in them. Yeah. Myrtle says there was also a practical reason the family stuck with soccer. Coming here as an immigrant um, and parent, you can't afford to, to put your kid into um, hockey. Well, one reason, <laughs> the other reason was like for a black kid to be playing hockey, you know, especially in Brampton, like that, that was unheard of. So 
Yeah. Something else that was unheard of at that time in Brampton was that people could be so passionate about soccer. Atiba's father, Dalton, played at a high level in Trinidad, and to him, soccer wasn't just a game. I always take it serious. Always take it serious. You know, like, you hear coaches say, we're just having fun, but I never look at it like that. I look at it like it's a way out. This could be a future, you know? So you got to work hard at it and to be better than, than whoever. I say you have to be the best. I always tell him that, you have to be the best. That's how serious I, t I take the game since he was about six years old. And Atiba succeeded, big time. He excelled at every level. This one, remember this? Canadian Soccer Association. Atiba's older brother, Halden, never doubted Atiba would go all the way. He says Atiba lived by his parents' example. Ontario yes. Cup champions. Yes. Dad was a hardworking man, and my mom was just so, so committed to, you know, figuring out this, this Canadian system. And they were great role models for us. And they showed us that, you know, if you work hard um, and if you try to figure things out, the world will open up for you and provide you with opportunities. Atiba Hutchison is about to live the opportunity of a lifetime at the World Cup. But that's not the end of the story. Meet his nine-year-old nephew, Akai. What does soccer mean to you? Soccer is like, I, I play it every day. It's like my life. How come? Because my uncle plays it and he inspired me to play it too. I think that I might be like Uncle Tiba and play for Canada's national team. And that's the dream for most kids here, especially on the eve of the World Cup. And to help them get there, there's one thing Coach Gardner says he won't lose track of. For us as coaches, it, it's about helping them, most of all, to fall in love with the game. Because if they fall in love with the game and they enjoy what they do, they're going to put more energy, more effort, more thought, more focus, more concentration into it, and we'll continue to do that. I mean, is that the secret sauce here in Brampton? Get them to fall in love with the game? Yes, absolutely. They need to fall in love with the game and be the best that you can be. And that's the lesson Coach Gardner hopes the team will take to Qatar. So when it comes to this competition, the World Cup, we're all excited. The talent is there, and we know that when they go out and they hit the field, that they're going to surprise a lot of countries. Do you mean the team from Canada or the team from Brampton? I think both, because the team from Canada wouldn't be the team that it is without the lads from Brampton. Nick Purden, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. I'm betting some of you shared your excitement for the World Cup in GIF form, and it may have featured this man. GIFs are like my children, and I know that it's like, oh, you can't say that there's a favorite. Becoming GIF famous in our moment. Thousands of Torontonians braved the cold for today's Santa Claus parade, the first one since before the pandemic. For many, this marks the start of the Christmas season. Among those taking part this year, Toronto police, Indigenous groups, public sector workers, and of course, the big guy himself. If gifts from Santa are not your thing, what about gifts from this man, Robert E. Blackmon? He's the face behind some of the most watched gifts on earth. From a small town in Ontario, he's creating those short-looped videos every day, amassing 10.6 billion views. His rise to GIF stardom is our moment. Uh, we need to discuss your life choices. Uh, we need to discuss your life choices. I had zero expectations when I started. Didn't think anybody would see them. I was on holiday in Switzerland, and literally there was this mountaintop. I literally thought of Julie Andrews and the Sound of Music. So I gave my camera to my husband and I said, I just want you to film this. Got back to the hotel room, literally uploaded, didn't think anything of it. The next morning I woke up and it had like 5 million views. I could not believe. What? Gifts are like my children. I love the outrageous ones. 
And I won an award for one of my year in ones, which was me dragging the trash out at the end of 2020. And I'd superimposed 2020 over it. I always say, if there's a situation, there is a gift for it. And more than likely, I have probably already created that gift. So in case you're wondering, he says that it is GIF, not GIF. That's been the source of some debate in the newsroom, but we figure he's the expert. So let's consider that issue settled now. The other thing is he's moved on to another creative outlet. Guess what? TikTok videos. That is the National for November the 20th. Good night.